check goods. This is Bart Yates and Josh Wimmer. And um, this is our research project is the implications of the band inspector sum on the band's multiple model. This is something that Dr. Barry Bickmore in the geology department has been studying. And it's uh, the DMM is a force field. And for our presentation today, we're going to try to get through a lot. So we're going to describe the problem that we were looking at and why we are building a new force field. Um, then we're going to go over what a force field actually is and why you as a scientist should care about it. Then we'll um, describe a possible solution to some of the problems that we described earlier. And one of these things will be the expansion of the bond valence model. And after that, we will go over what the three of us specifically have been working on, which is how the valence vector sum is, can be predicted with the fraction ionic character. And then we will discuss our methods and our results and the implications of our results. So first things first, what is a force field? Okay. Um, I guess there's a few of, you, a few of us in here, I guess, uh, don't really understand it all too well. Um, to put it simply, it's a simple way to do molecular mechanics. So molecular mechanics are, is a really complicated field where we've actually run some stuff on a supercomputer and it's taken a ton of time on the supercomputer to run here on campus. So a force field is a way to cheat that and to get the data that you need without having to use a supercomputer. Um, so molecular mechanics, think like balls and springs, okay? You have atoms, in between them is a spring. They can compress and expand. Molecular mechanics is the way to find the optimal length of that spring between those two atoms, um, given their electronegativities. And so the reason that we don't like this molecular formula theory it's because it's just very computationally expensive. Like you said, it takes, I mean, it will take us hours to run the most simple molecules you can think of, like just a water molecule, it, it takes several hours. And also, just because of this, this ex computational expense, it's very limited in the range of atoms that you can use. All right, so what we really want to convey to you guys, and um, you may be thinking, I thought I was in a geology conference, and you still are. But um, this applies to you as well, because everyone deals with the big data problem. We're trying to crunch lots of data, and um, sometimes our molecular mechanic techniques that we have now aren't efficient enough, and Barry believes, or Dr. Bigmore believes, that the valence multiple model would be a more effective way of doing that. So what is the valence multiple model? Is uh, basically what we want to do is we're taking the, the bond valence model and we're going to expand it. We want to be able to make it more predictive and more quantitative. So the, the bond valence model right now, what it describes is, I mean, we all learned this in mineralogy, but I immediately forgot how to define it, so I'm sure most of us did too. Um, what it means though is it's basically describing the distortion of a molecule. So off of the 180 degrees, these distortions are caused by you know, long pair effects. There's something called the second order John Taylor effect that Barry has recently been talking about in some of his papers. And we're gonna, we want to be able to expand this model and using something called the dipole and the quadrupole moment. Don't worry about those, shouldn't have mentioned them. But, and to make this, multi, this new force field that is much broader and computationally easy. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about, about the uh, valence vector sum. It's really important in the valence multiple model because it explains the geometry of a molecule really well. So for an example, we'll use the uh, water molecule here with two hydrogens and oxygen. These arrows represent the uh, valence units. And according to Pauling's second rule that we also learned in mineralogy, they are incident to the central anion. So the valence vector sum of this molecule would be 1.6 valence units. Right? This number can give us an indication of the geometry of a molecule, and then we can use that to try and predict or try to understand a little bit better of the actual and overall shape of a molecule and other factors of it. We're going to do that by um, plotting the valence vector sum in, against the uh, fraction ion character. Josh was just explaining we need to understand the valence vector sum, but we also need to 
understand the fraction and character. And in mineralogy, you guys might have remembered this term being used. And um, if you don't remember what it means, all you need to know is that it is describing how ionic a bond is between two atoms. And for our purposes today, um, the way we are describing bonds is that an ionic bond is the transfer of electron of an electron um, between a, two atoms with very different electronegativities, and then a covalent bond is the sharing of an electron in the outside orbital um, between two atoms with similar electronegativities. Okay, so how we ran this experiment is what we did is we were just looking at um, molecules. We just based on really as simple molecules as we can get. So we want just a central atom, which is usually oxygen, sulfur, selenium. And we want two other atoms as a one valence unit bonding to it, or just simply known as a single bond. So Hannah first started this project just searching through different papers, finding experimental data for oxygen molecules, and then the, the two single bonds bonded to that single oxygen molecule. And then once Josh and I came on, we started using the supercomputer, uh, it's called Mary Lou, and the Gaussian program that's on it to optimize geometries of sulfur and selenium molecules, and which gave us a lot bigger data set that we could use. And so what we did then is we wanted to make find valence vector sum as a function of fra fraction ionic character. So we plotted, this is our y and our x data, and then we used MATLAB to make a best fit line, a, a third degree polynomial best fit line of these data points that we have. Yeah, I'm going to show you the results really quickly here, but just remember that when you're looking at it, the valence vector sum is a representation of the geometry of the molecule, and the fraction ionic character is a representation of how ionic it is. So here we have our XOY molecules. Again, this is an oxygen um, atom bonded to two other atoms, and it's a, a single bond to each of those. And we have our fraction ionic character, where one is the most ionic um, type of bond, and zero would be the most covalent type of bond. And our valence vector sum, we see a very um, strong trend between the two. And here is a third order polynomial equation that we found on MATLAB. And again, all these data points were collected from previous papers, um, mostly Brown and Alderman papers. And here we have our excess Y molecules, so sulfur bonded to two other atoms. And um, again, you see a really clear trend. These data points were collected from optimizing things with GOSFU and the supercomputing lab. And um, one thing to notice as we go through these is that oxygen and sulfur and selenium, as they go down the periodic table in their column, um, along these trend lines, you see that this line right here is moving to be more ionic where it's dropping down. So uh, you can see that when you go back. That's something that we're really interested in. Exactly, and we think that this is a spatial issue, and we think that it can be explained by the Van der Waals atomic radii. So we plan to create a three-dimensional graph with the data that we have already, with the z-axis being the Van der Waals atomic radii, create um, equations to get the planes so we can have a better understanding and a better initial guess for our um, force field. So basically what we want to do with our whole project is we want to be able to find, be able to describe the valence vector sum or the geometry of a molecule because it's computationally more expensive with the ionic, or the fraction ionic character with something that we can, I mean, you can do it on a calculator really easy. And the, um, the Van der Waals ionic radius that's because that's like a tabulated thing that we can look up, anyone can look up really easily. So with these two parameters, we hope to be able to get a good um, description of the geometry of a molecule, and therefore being able to apply it to the broader sense of our force field, being able to, uh, just to predict more types of molecules and making them quantitatively accurate. These are our references, so. Back to graphs. Yeah. Back, uh, I put one of the equation. Yeah. Okay. Why did you choose a third-order polynomial to fit the data? 
Um, so theoretical that, reason for doing that? No, the basically, <laughs> our sulfur data, so this is the one we had the most points on. And I was, I was the one who actually ran the amount of data as well, they were sitting right next to me. But, and this one fit really well with our sulfur, and we wanted to keep them constant through. And so because this one fits so well, we just tried to keep it on the other two, even though the fits weren't as good as it was with sulfur. Let's go back to your, uh, yeah, that one. Looks like you're failing to describe 50% of the data when you're down there with a low valence vector sum. It's really hard to find molecules that fit that perfectly because you're trying to find angles with a certain geometry in that area. So it's really hard to find um, molecules in that area. What angle is it that we're looking for down there? Um, oh. You mean like this this gap right here? Oh, you're talking about the gap. I meant that down there. Oh, over oh we, yeah. we did that on purpose because we knew that this was, was zero, right? And so how we did our line is that we said if it was greater than, I think we did like somewhere in here, then we just like, then just ignore it. It's going to be zero. So our trend line will actually come down, hit about 0.5, and then be zero. So you're thinking of when you use this model of your computations, you have two different realms. Uh, Below 0.5, you'd use this equation. Below above 0.5, you'd use just a, a flat line. You basically guess. What, what's a zero valence vector sum? Zero valence vector sum. So it's related to. What would that look like? So it's more ionic. So I think it's 180 degree molecule is what I believe. I hope my things right because um, you add together the vectors, and so it would be zero. And so that, that, that switching, where as you go from oxygen to sulfur swinging at uh, zero point, is it different? If you go to your next molecule, yeah, yeah, it's getting over, it's and then further over, and then over farther. Yeah, I think it's just the difference between electronegativities and the main ion, because most of the points that we used. Wrong, but are similar. We did like the same molecules, but just switch out the anions. And then we'll apply the atomic here. And another thing that we, I think we failed to emphasize very well was we just needed an initial guess and an initial value for the force field of what we were doing. So uh, Dr. Bickmore is working with uh, another professor um, back east, and he's working on what's called an energy cost function. And so that's going to be making up kind of the difference in the um, deviation from our line of best fit to be able to work better. That's a lot higher math and knowledge, so it's going to take that one over. 